Welcome to the Criterion Chat, a podcast about cinema in the Criterion Collection. I'm Matt Peterson, joined by Nate Myers. Tonight, Terrence Malick's sprawling The Tree of Life, released in 2011. Winner of the Palme d'Or Khan, Malick's lyrical style takes new shape and scope in this tale of childhood, parenting, marriage, and the origins of life itself. Stars Brad Pitt and Jessica Chastain anchor the film's winding, expressionistic examination of a small-town family, while Sean Penn plays their grown son, haunted by his relationship with his father, or lack thereof. Gorgeous visuals, lensed by Oscar winner Emmanuel Lubezki, buoy an otherwise narratively sparse film. Emotions are a focus here, not plot. Understandably, the film was not a box office supernova, but it was certainly a critical darling, and its impact and import have seemed only to grow with the passage of time. Grow up with us and Malik as we climb the tree of life. So Nate, uh, this is a, a film that I knew we would have to discuss at some point, and... I've been looking forward to it, but also dreading it at the same time. It's <laughs> it's something that that's probably when you picked it, Matt. I was like, "Huh, okay." <laughs> yeah, well, I I feel like it's just something we have to go through because I have to confess I really struggle with this film, and I, probably my turn to take the unpopular opinion when it comes to. Uh, This film, definitely uh, among film fans, at least, or among cinephiles, I'm not a big fan of this film. I I really struggle with it. I've had kind of a real up-and-down relationship with it. Um, And and this is coming from someone who's a big Malick fan. I mean, I've pointed out many times throughout our various programs that Thin Red Line is, you know, my favorite film of all time. So I'm not anti-Malick by any stretch of the imagination, but I just have had a hard time connecting with this film. And I, I remember when the trailer came out and I was so excited that this film was coming out. You know, this is this uh, long gestating project from Malick, uh, originally conceived of many decades ago. It was originally called Q, which has probably a new connotation today, but who knows? Uh the... Can I just say before you go further, <laughs> when you when you hear about the original concept, because yeah. I think they approached him about doing something like this right after Days of Heaven. Yeah. And uh, I think in, in that original concept, when it was under the title of Q, didn't he have the idea of uh, a dinosaur having existential thoughts and just reflecting on the universe as a major portion of the movie at that time wasn't that one of the things that yeah i think it was like a a, a minotaur concept like a minotaur or a minotaur that's right yeah some kind of a a mythical (laughs) beast of some kind yeah exactly uh which sounds even more bonkers than what we ended up getting here um but but yeah back to just my initial exposure to this film like i said the trailer was very exciting you know these gorgeous visuals uh coming off the heels of the new world. And when I saw the film in the theater, I it just kind of left me cold. I mean, I, I, I felt like the visuals were spectacular and and the lyrical nature of the film, you know, had its moments that were very effective. But for some reason, it just never coalesced for me. And, you know, I've revisited it several times since, and now we have this new extended cut that's available on the Criterion release you know, we'll get into things in more detail. I, I, I don't want to start this off by just panning the film. I, I do like quite a bit about this film, but it's it's a challenging film for me, and not not in the way that is a good type of challenging, I guess. Um, I'll just leave it there for now and just throw it back to you. So, what are your experiences uh, with this film? Your initial impressions. I, I get the sense that you probably like this film more than I do. Well, Matt, uh, after you, I think probably shot us in the foot with any fan base, uh, by your opening here, I'll come and try to, uh, back clean up here okay. uh, for our, for our <laughs> podcast and our company. Um, I, uh, 
I, re- I was actually surprised when you picked this map because I remembered when it came out, it came out 10 years ago. Uh, it had a lot of fanfare around it uh, from Cannes, of course. It won the Palme d'Or, as you said in your opening. And the, the buzz from critics was talking about it as a masterpiece, not just as a good film, but as a masterpiece yeah. of this already quite revered filmmaker. And then you had some people speaking about it, whether it was critics or just I remember especially some people like religious uh, publications uh, were talking about this as one of the greatest films ever made or the most powerful films they'd ever seen. So it had huge anticipation to it, as you were saying. Yeah. And I, we're both Malik fans, so I think we naturally were also intrigued by it. And when your reaction came back negative to it, I was absolutely stunned because I would never have expected that. And I I, I look at this film and go, well, Matt, this is right up your alley in so many ways. A lot of its sensibilities are yours yeah. in terms of not particularly linear, not slavish to a plot, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, and here I was, it's somebody who I think naturally would not be inclined towards this. It, it would probably strike me as being maybe, well, at, at, at the time, we could talk about Malik's uh, career trajectory following this film because uh, it went in some unfortunate places, but... Uh, at the time, it certainly would have been, I think, the one of his films that would have been least appealing to me. And I, I actually found it very, being very moved by it. I don't think it's a perfect film. I, I never quite went into that realm of uh, Gaga for this uh, movie. But I did really find it particularly effective. I appreciated its honesty. Its visual mastery was quite impressive. Uh, I love the use of the music in it. Uh, it's a highly emotional film, right? A, a very subjective film. Yeah. That... Really, honestly, I know I'm not the first person to make this comparison, but it really brings and harkens back to 2001 A Space Odyssey in many ways. In terms of its ambition, thematically, in terms of its willingness to just sort of allow cinematic form to be at the front of what it's doing and to put character and dialogue and all those other things in the background. Uh, And, of course, I'm not a fan of 2001. You are, of course. Uh, So I, I always found our reactions to this Interesting, and of course, I was interested to hear where you were at it ten years later because as I watched it again uh, for this podcast, I watched it when I picked up the Blu-ray when it came out, and then I really hadn't uh, watched it since then, and I only watched it maybe a handful of times over the past decade. But I found myself, especially watching it this time, relating to it differently than I remembered relating to it ten years ago. Uh, partly because of my own experiences in life have changed, uh, people I've met work I've done has changed over those 10 years. And so it it spoke to me in a different way. I was just curious if it speaks to you in a different way, if you had that same kind of reaction to this movie. Yeah, it definitely has changed for me. And there are things that I do appreciate much more at this point, you know, 10 years later, um, you know, 10 years ago, I did not have kids. I've got uh, two boys now. And there was quite a bit here that, that hit home in that regard, just the experience of being a parent and, and some of the moments, uh, in this film, uh, just the struggle of, of finding that balance between, uh, showing, you know, compassion and love for your children, but also, uh, raising them with a a level of discipline and preparing them for the world. So striking that balance, I think is something that's challenging for any parent. And I think this film illustrates that beautifully, uh, with with Brad Pitt and Jessica Chastain and and you know they they kind of symbolize the idea of nature versus grace right so nature being more Brad Pitt's character and grace being more of uh, Jessica Chastain's character and these two kind of competing forces in the lives of their their children specifically Jack uh, who's the the main focus uh, played by Hunter McCracken for most of the film, but we also see him as an adult played by Sean Penn. Um, and uh, yeah, those aspects, the the parental aspects definitely hit home for me more. Um, so that certainly enhanced my experience this time around. Um, I, I do appreciate, you know, what Malik is trying to do here. I mean, this is a very ambitious film stylistically, uh, it, thematically, you compared to 2001. I mean, even down to Douglas Trumbull being involved in the visual effects here. Of course, he 
pioneered the visual effects in Kubrick's 2001 as well. So there's some interesting connections there, even from a historical standpoint. Uh, but I, I don't feel like it's as successful as Kubrick uh, in his film because of it's it's hard it's hard to articulate. I mean, I think the disjointed nature of the film, the lyrical, nonlinear nature of the film, uh, does kind of add some uh, mud to the waters, I guess, in terms of the clarity of the themes and the messages here. And it leaves a lot of, to open to interpretation with, with the uh, or for the audience, which is you know a good thing. But for me, it just is not as effective as I want the film to be. Like I, I can see what it's trying to do, and somehow all those pieces just don't quite connect. They don't quite coalesce. And I, I've been really racking my brain trying to understand. You know, what doesn't work for me here? And you're right to say that this is very much in my wheelhouse, right? I I, I like more visually oriented, uh, expressionistic type films, not linear films, elliptical um, films. So why doesn't this quite work for me? And why does it work for you, Nate? <laughs> I mean, that's that's the other the other mystery here. And that's a big reason why I wanted to talk about it was, you know, it's like, let's kind of try to parse through this. And I, we may not come to a conclusion by, by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, I, I thought it was, it was worth exploring because it was one of those films that's kind of an enigma to me uh, in terms of our own reactions to it. Uh, but also... Just the film itself is interesting in terms of its history, how it came together, you know, the fact we have two versions here now. Um, I, I guess I'll throw it back to you here. Any any, any thoughts coming off of that uh, stream Sir, of consciousness I, I, here? I, yeah. It certainly is a film that's going to be hard for us to talk about because of the lack of a plot. I mean, yeah. what do you try to latch on to? Because I think... You how you attach yourself and enter into the film is actually going to be different from person to person. Some people talk about this film as well. Really, what we're seeing is Jack, as played by Sean Penn, his memory. Right? It's all kind of an exploration of his memories, and there's a lot of interpretation of what's going on that's not really explicitly stated. We we have this initial kind of experience or, or, or scene setting of uh, the the mother character who does not have a first name but mrs o'brien played by jessica chastain uh and she is remembering her own childhood right and then you move forward and you see different other memories and you get then of course the devastating news that she receives of her her son her second son rl having died at the age of 19 we don't even know how it doesn't say explicitly but a lot of people interpret the the imagery to think that he died in a in a military service, perhaps in Vietnam, the timeline would have worked out. Yeah, you know, for I, that, was, but I always thought that was what occurred, yeah. I, You know, it's funny because uh, Malik had a brother that committed suicide around the same time, around the same age, and was not, uh, you know, he was a guitarist or training to be a guitarist. And so I've always wondered, is it really meant to not be the military, but that his brother committed suicide? You know, it's kind of him dabbling in his own autobiography here uh, with this particular film. So it's just, it's a fascinating thing. And I think it's, you know, again, a question of like, how do you even understand the character of Jack? If you do take him as your entry point, is he meant to be a surrogate for Terrence Malick? It seems certainly like that. Yeah. Uh, Malick seems to p- askew that interpretation, but I, I think that he's not being honest in that. I think it's, I think it's probably legitimate to think of him as this. And for people who know Malick and grew up with him, uh, that there's too many similarities in the O'Brien family to the Malik family to ignore and think that, no, it's not really him sorting through his own memories, his own relationships, and exploring them in a fictional way, but nonetheless, I think, uh, uh, certainly a, an honest and sincere way. Uh, but there's another way of looking at this film, which is that this is the way I kind of look at it, why I think it works for me is I don't see it as really being about memory. If it was, I don't think it works particularly well because I think the character of Jack, particularly as an adult, as Sean Penn's part, isn't 
compelling. And honestly, I wouldn't mind if that whole part was maybe omitted. Uh, although I, I find it somewhat interesting and visually very arresting at times, but it really doesn't speak to me on an emotional level or on an intellectual level. But I really think of this film almost as being told from the point of view of God and God looking in at things. And, you know, the, the, the real beginning is that quote from Job, right? Where were you when I made this? And when the men, the sons of men rejoiced. And so I think that the film really sets out to try to answer that question. And that question to me, as it is presented here and portrayed here is a fascinating one. You, you see the birth of the cosmos, you see dinosaurs, uh, you see humans, you see it is it a, one of the most brilliant moves. I think the, the, the news of the death of the sun is what precedes the creation sequence, which we can, I suppose, uh, maybe dwell in on that one if we want. And then following that creation sequence, you go into the birth of their oldest son, Jack, and you start seeing the early childhood and development of the family. And what a, what a bold visual move to connect this massive event of the creation of the universe with something so intimate and common as the creation of a human life. And to see the, a parallel between them, I think the film does a great job of connecting those parallels. So that's what works for me about it. It's not perfect. Like I said, there's things that I think you could move around or get rid of, and it might even work more effectively. Uh, I think the ending is really not interesting, to be honest with you. Um, it always reminds me of the end of eight and a half, actually. I was just going to mention and that, actually. <laughs> not in a good way. <laughs> not in a good way. I, I, whenever I watch it, I think eight and a half's ending is a lot better. Yeah. Um, but yeah. so that's kind of where it comes for me. I don't know if that helps give you any insights or anything you want to run off of there. Yeah, I mean, that's helpful. And, and it's hard for me to argue with anything you're saying, right? I, I, I think, you know, Ma- Malik is the way an audience I think experiences a Malick film is always going to be fairly subjective, especially his newer films. And this is a turning point for him for sure. Yeah. And I I think, I think it's important to talk about that, you know, yeah, what this film symbolizes in terms of his, the trajectory of his career. So, you know, prior to this, uh, we had thin red line in, in, um, 1998. And then we had the new world after that. And, in the new world, we start to see the origins of the storytelling style here, and even in the Thin Red Line. I mean, there are there's certainly lyrical sequences. I think you see it all the way back, even to Days of Heaven, with the the narration and just kind of letting people kind of walk around and very naturalistic. Yeah, but, but it's the, also not in the least bit autobiographical, right? Yeah, and this he he becomes very interested in himself with this film, and then for the next decade following it, he. He kind of just is making movies about him, right? Well, I, I would agree with that. It sounds like Malik, as you said, disagrees with that. But uh, it, it does seem like he's examining his own psyche in many ways uh, by, by making these films. And, and I agree. You can see the origins of the storytelling style, you know, back to even his first feature. But, you know, I, I feel like the new world really started to take that um, kind of uh, wandering sort of free flowing style, uh, to the next level. And then this film is pretty much entirely composed of that. Right. And I, I do feel like it's, it really suffers from excess in that regard. Like I, I feel like Malik is at his best when he's really balancing those elements, kind of those more traditional narrative elements with the more lyrical kind of free flowing sequences. And, and how they interrelate to each other in the New World and the Thin Red Line for me is just far more effective because you you, can, you have that grounding of a more traditional filmmaking style, really coupled with this more expressionistic uh, style, and it's to me much more powerful when those sequences occur when it's nested in kind of a more traditionally uh, presented film narrative or just. Uh, more traditional film style. So when a film is entirely composed of, of those more expressionistic sequences like this film is, for me, it just kind of loses something and it starts to feel redundant and kind of one note. 
um, you know, the, there's a pretty intimate examination of childhood throughout this film. I mean, I, I, I can't think of many other films that really try to dive into the experience of childhood as much as this one. And, and I think there's a lot of moments that people can relate to just growing up. And, uh, the film is kind of hyper detailed when it comes to some of those bits. And, and I appreciate that, but again, it still feels excessive to me. And I feel like, I feel like this could be a really strong, you know, 90 minute to maybe hour, 45 minute length film. Uh, and, you know, we get the opposite here, right? So we get the, the extended three-hour cut, and we can go into that more later on. Uh, but it's, it's just a film that its excesses work against it for me. Um, but again, I, the visuals are spectacular. I mean, Lubezki's work here is incredible. Some of the moments they capture... You just wonder how it happened. I mean, I, you know, I think of the little bit with Jessica Chastain and the, uh, the butterfly. These kind of serendipitous moments that they happen to capture are, are really pretty incredible. Uh, and the, you know, you mentioned the, the creation sequence. You know, gorgeous in-camera effects. Uh, there were some digital effects here too, but much of this was done in-camera. I men- mentioned Douglas Trumbull and... Uh, I'm trying to remember the, the name of the other visual effects um, guy that was on this. I can look it up here. Oh, Dan Glass is the other visual effects supervisor, which I, I think oh, he... Oh, from The Matrix. And I think he was involved in um, Aronofsky's uh, The Fountain as well, which has some similar visuals that were uh, practically photographed. And very very effective work there. I mean, it's a beautiful sequence. That you, you mentioned the use of music. Um, there's some some great classical cues here, uh, but also original score from um, uh, Alexandre Duplat. So, I, from a technical standpoint, yeah, it's it's fantastic. You know, it, it's some of the most memorable memorable visuals. I think you can. Uh, you can imagine in a film, but again, it's, it's just, it's that lack of cohesion for me and really that kind of lack of discipline in terms of really distilling this film down to the most essential moments. I, and I really think if that process continued and this was really honed down to a shorter length, I think it would have been more effective and more powerful and I know a lot of people are going to disagree with me on that. Um, so I, I, I guess I'll throw I it back to you, Nate, you in terms the... of... I guess I'll just ask a question quick. With with narrative um, uh, you know, choices here, or Malick's stylistic choices here, I mean, I, how do you feel about the real pivot this film takes, you know, in terms of Malick's style? It, subsequently, we had... You know, films like uh, To the Wonder and Night of Cups and Song to Song that really took this style even further in some ways. But, you know, I, To the Wonder, I actually like that film a lot, and I responded to that film much better than this one, even though stylistically it's pretty much the same. And so ultimately I think these later fil- Malik films are almost like a Rorschach test for, for people. And it, it either speaks to you or it doesn't, and it's very hard to articulate why that may or may not be the case. I'm glad you brought up some of those films that came after this. He also did a documentary called Voyage of Time. Which, he had two yeah, I have not of it. seen. Those, I, I, it's not even... I saw a, the IMAX one. Okay. But um, I didn't see the other. There's, there's one that's in IMAX that was shot for IMAX and played in IMAX theaters. I don't believe it was ever released elsewhere. That was narrated by Brad Pitt. And then he had another one that was narrated by Kate Blanchett, which I have not seen that version of it. And uh, again, visually amazing, you know, but I thought those, a lot of those movies were really not that good. I never saw Song to Song uh, after Night of Cups. I thought, eh, I don't think I need to do this again. Uh, that movie was pretty awful. But I, I, the word you used a while ago, Matt, was balanced. And I think, you know, that's a good point. I think... At this point in his career, 
while Malick was not by any means a a major director that would be a commercial director, he was certainly uh, hailed as a, a visionary, right? And probably was given a little bit more carte blanche on this film than would happen with a lot of directors. And so he probably is overly indulgent at certain points here. And I think that comes through, particularly in that final sequence that's almost like the eschaton or something of that nature. That, you know, you could, I guess, try to interpret that, that final ending however you yeah, think it always, it always likely, seemed like, but that, like the afterlife. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, it feels like that's what he's going for there. So, you know, things like that, I think you could see, like, yeah, there's a lack of balance. I think, in many ways, uh, you mentioned To the Wonder. I think that is the better film, and it's a shame that one doesn't get more attention and more uh, more respect because I think that finds the balance much more about how to take this more experimental style of storytelling and character development and just allowing your audience to meditate on what's being presented to it yeah. while also still having a very clear sense of character and story and movement, right? This one is, uh, is so over the place, all over the place, and changes things so much that I think it, it gets a little out of whack at times. But that's where, again, I think if you look at it not from the story of, of a human's memory, but rather as the story of God and creation and the tree of life, right? It does kind of, in the in the whole madness of it, work. And there's a sense where you kind of look at life itself and you go, life is overwhelming. It isn't perfectly balanced. It is at times confounding. It is at times uh, going to be frustrating. It's at times going to just blow you away with its beauty and its power. And then other times just leave you wanting more and wanting more in a bad way, wanting more in a good way sometimes. Yeah. And so I think the film really captures that in a way that other movies do not. And I also want to just, if I could just take a moment here to, to applaud it for the honesty about childhood. So often movies are dishonest about uh, childhood, especially when it's looking back. The kid almost is like a, either a a perfect angel or is just this wonderful avatar that you can attach to uh, to make sense of the world. And this is not, right? Jack is a very complicated character. Yeah. He has a bad relationship with his father. He has an unhealthy relationship with his mother, to be honest. Um, he has clear like emotional disturbances that are not coming from his upbringing, you know, I mean, you get the sense that he's not really fair to his own father at, at times, you know, and the movie shows some very dark behavior and very dark thoughts that a lot of kids do have. And I, I appreciate the fact that it's willing to explore that and deal with that and be honest about that, which I think, you know, some people talk about this film being nostalgic and I don't think of it as nostalgic because nostalgia is almost like a, a false memory, a false creation of the past. Yeah, it's to it's look not, and feel a certain way. This it, one, I think, is honest. It's, it's not idealized in any way, really. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think that the film, you know, it's just the the characters. I can relate to them. I can understand them uh, without really having a lot of clear things to hold on to, which is to me an incredible accomplishment from a director and an editing standpoint here. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about the the cinematography with with good cause, uh, but the editing and there's a whole team of editors. I think there's like half a dozen editors on this film, yeah. which, considering how much footage they shot, they probably needed that. Uh, but they they just really composed, I think, rather an impressive thing to be able to bring this all together and to have it be coherent. Because it's amazing that you really do have. I mean, Matt, is, even though we maybe have very different responses to this movie. Now that one of us seems to be in dispute over what's going on in the movie exactly either, right? Which is pretty amazing. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I kind of feel guilty having this conversation be because it's a film that I want to love, right? And, and being a Malick fan, it seems kind of uh, blasphemous to, to not be a huge proponent of this film, but, um, well, I, I agree with you about the editing. I mean, it must've been an enormous task to try to assemble something 
that has any level of coherence. There's a, an essay on the Criterion website about the the extended cut and the work that was put into that, and there's a picture on there of all the footage uh, that was shot for this film, and it's just boxes and boxes and boxes of film reels kind of sitting in this warehouse. Uh, incredible volume of footage that, that was shot for this, right? And it must have been very, very difficult to really uh, pick those best moments because I'm sure most, if not all, the film uh, that was shot looked pretty spectacular uh, if if what we're seeing here is any indication. So I, it's probably a good time to get into the extended cut, right? So Criterion pretty much financed or at least championed, you know, the, the creation of this extended cut. So Malik, uh, Lubezki, they were all heavily involved. Um, and it was created especially for Criterion's release. And I, I don't believe the extended edition ever had a theatrical release. It was just for the, the, uh, the Blu-ray. And it's, it's an interesting uh, version of the film, and it, it does not feel structurally uh, very different, right? I mean, the the film, the trajectory of the film is pretty much unchanged. The messages are pretty much unchanged. It just fleshes out more character moments. It's more, more complete details. in a sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it truly is an extended cut, right? It's adding to existing scenes. It's reinserting new scenes. It's not um, restructuring the film in a profound way. And I, I mean, here, here I go again now in terms of saying... I was underwhelmed with the extended cut myself. Yeah, it's, um, it's it, kind of too much of a good thing, I guess, in terms of the power of the visuals, right? I mean, the new, the new scenes, again, they look great. Uh, there's some interesting moments there. But it starts to feel even more redundant to me than even the theatrical version did. Um, I, I I don't think I, I like the extended cut has a little bit more for Mister O'Brien by Brad Pitt, right? His I was just going to say, better, yeah, I think his character. Those are but the parts the, I the appreciate the most. The extra stuff with most. Jack as an adult, right? Yeah, I think the stuff with Jack as an adult doesn't really aid the film. To be honest, um, seeing more of him probably works against it, in all honesty. And I think even the little bit where you get Jack going off to the boarding school, yeah. uh, which is in the extended cut, it's 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 worth kind of, I think, including the mother seeing and confronting how did I not work out well? And it's not just your dad. You know, I think that that else interesting. But I really just appreciated the stuff with with. Brad Pitt, because I think he gives a very good performance here that kind of gets lost in the storytelling. Yeah. Uh, you, you, It becomes so one note, and I think there's a lot more nuance going on in it, but the way it's presented, the the way there's so little dialogue for him, it becomes one note, which is probably intentional. I, I think it's meant to be this is kind of a, a, a child, a, a disgruntled child's view of a father in some sense, but it seems unfortunate because I think there's more to this character and I think there's more in the performance that comes through. And the, the extended cut, that's where I see a value to it. But overall, it, it didn't really change things the way I'd been led to believe it might. Yeah, I almost expected a, a pretty radical restructuring of the film initially just when I heard that this project was taking place. And Malik's no stranger to alternate cuts. I mean, The New World has three cuts that are available on the uh, the Criterion release. And each of those are actually fairly different from one another, um, far more so than the differences between uh, the extended cut here and the original. Uh, there's some real structural changes to the new world that um, are are pretty significant. But I, I agree with you on, on the, the added Brad Pitt material. I think, you know, his depiction of Mr. Bryan is very effective and very nuanced. And, you know, he's a man who's just very bitter about his, his circumstances. He feels that, you know, he lives in a world that uh, is really corrupt and uh, people are 
uh, being exploited or taking advantage of constantly. And, and he feels like he's a victim of that, that system. And ultimately, you know, takes it out on his, his children in, in some ways, but also he wants to prepare his, his children to be in that world. And that, that really informs his decision-making in terms of how he disciplines his children and, and how he relates to them. And yeah, seeing kind of more about his work environment and, and circumstances uh, makes him a more sympathetic character in some ways. Uh, maybe sympathetic is the wrong word, but it, we just understand him more. And he becomes less just like a force of nature in the film and more of a, of a well-rounded human being. Jessica Chastain's character, you know, she does have some additional material here. There's some interplay between her and her brother that is helpful, but she never quite escapes from that image of this kind of angelic force, right? Uh, She's basically silent during a lot of the family interactions, especially at the dinner table. She just kind of sits there and doesn't seem to really um, have an issue with how Brad Pitt or his uh, his character is interacting with his children. There's, an, of course, a big exception to that later in the film. But her character always still feels a bit thin to me, and, and she really does seem like a child's memory of their mother and a very idealized memory at that. So... Uh, yeah, I would for agree. sure because I mean yeah. you obviously you have this scene with her like flying. You have the yeah. I mean this very clearly hagiographic vision of her. In yeah, the film. that's that's a bit much for me that bit. But <laughs> um, I, I, okay, now Matt, honestly, yeah. I, do I, are you even the Matt I know? Because that's straight <laughs> out of Tarkovsky. I I know I know it is. Uh, <laughs> I'm still the same person. For some reason, it just doesn't work for me in this film. I mean, it works for me in a Tarkovsky film, but not not quite in this one because, as you said, I think your interpretation is a good one. You know, this is really from God's point of view, and that moment does seem to be this idealized memory. Like, you know, my mother was an angel, and, you know, she just kind of floated above all things. And I, I... I don't necessarily think God, you know, views human beings in that way. Um, you know, if we're if we're going to stick with that interpretation of the film, but sure. I mean, that's yeah. a minor nitpick. Visually, it looks cool, right? I mean, I, if we want to be really uh, down to earth about it, um, if you'll pardon pardon the expression, <laughs> considering what we're talking about, but I I really think the extended cut yeah it doesn't help it really doesn't help i'm glad it exists it's really neat to see that extra footage and i respect criterion and all the people involved for all the effort they put into what must have been a really overwhelming project but um yeah it, it does it's the does the opposite the- of what I, I think the film needs right and it's just it's you know i think it's good just to talk about films that have multiple versions this is not a unique thing um and it's not just unique to movies i mean there's other works of art that have had multiple versions certain artists painters have painted the same subject on multiple occasions and in a certain sense that's kind of the same idea like you're doing different versions of the same thing right so uh i think that that's really the way that alternate cuts should be looked at here uh is it's really just one another version of the same story not a better version not a you know the, the definitive version the director's cut as people like to say i don't think there's any reason to think that the original version at 139 minutes isn't what malik wanted to put into theaters but it's one of those things where you kind of get to say well there's other materials that he pl- played around with and here's some fun things for people who really like this movie to kind of explore it a little more and uh, maybe flesh out a few thoughts here or there uh, in a different way. I'm wondering, Matt, if you just have any thoughts, though, because one theme that comes up again and again for this is just that sense of grace and nature, right? That's the big, huge uh, uh, divide, I guess, that's wrestled with by 
many characters and uh, in a certain sense the 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 O'Brien family the dad represents nature the mom represents grace uh to the boys uh but I think back to that creation sequence and the dinosaurs in particular that scene on the river with the two dinosaurs and the the herbivore and the carnivore and the carnivore deciding not to kill the herbivore that's injured and that just that kind of exploration of how things play out and the rest of the film there's a lot of scenes along a river i can't help but think that that particular scene with the dinosaurs is uh, much more important than maybe some people want to talk about I, I i don't get i think actually oftentimes people kind of look at that as as something to cut out and remove from the film. But I look at that as being one of the more important aspects of this film and what makes it so important or valuable or, or, or different than a lot of other memory pieces might be is the fact that it, it sets the stage in larger than just a human understanding and having the dinosaur in that exchange there then plays out in many ways over and over again in the story of these humans, right? The, the decision the, the, when the, when Jack gets into the animal cruelty, right, and you know the the moral complexity it starts to emerge for him in that, and uh, the the fight with the dad, right, the dad trying to teach him how to how to fight, and the you know all those things keep playing out over and over and over again. The shooting his brother with the BB gun, right, uh, you know these things that seem to be kind of now humans are are working through this in a way that other animals maybe have worked through it. I don't know if you have any thoughts about that at all. Yeah, I always saw that as an um, an example of of grace, right, or of mercy. I guess maybe is the best way to to describe that. And I think the film's kind of making the point that even beasts can be merciful, right? And if beasts can be merciful, then humans certainly can be. I guess that's the way I, I kind of interpreted that. And I, I do think that's a very significant moment, and it's clearly very intentional. It's kind of a strange thing to see, right? To to see dinosaurs acting in a way that does not seem instinctive, right? Does not seem to be in alignment with their predatory nature. And I, I think it's also maybe depicting the emergence of a higher level of consciousness in a way, you know, a morality. Right. I think it's yeah. getting at, yeah, it's getting at the idea of like exploring your surroundings, right? You. You live in a in a in a cosmos, right? And your life doesn't make sense without really trying to explore and understand and make sense to it and decide things about it. And I think one of the themes Malik is trying to show here is that that is how the world works all around us. Deso- decisions are made. Obviously, you could discuss and from a theological point of view, a philosophical point of view, the rationality of of other animals uh, compared to humans. But I think you know, the the point he's trying to say is that we're all part of this exploration of the world and trying to make sense of it. And it's very complicated. And I, I, that's one of the th- themes I think that comes through very splendidly in this film. Yeah. It's a film I'm going to continue to struggle with, I think. And it's a film that definitely has made an impact. Well, let me ask you this, Matt. Yeah. Yeah. Let me, cause I think, you know, film buffs all have movies that, they love movies that they hate. Yeah. And then there's this weird thing where it's a movie that you don't really like, but for some reason it keeps speaking to you or calling you to engage it, right? And uh, for me, 2001 is a kind of example like that, or Fight yeah. Club is an example of that for me, where I don't like it, but I kind of like the way I don't like it, right? Is that what this movie is for you? And if, if so, what do you think it is about those kinds of movies that hit film buffs that way, you know, that we have this movie that we don't like, but we keep visiting it. We keep trying to figure it out or solve it. What do you think that says about just cinema as an art form? I, I think it makes it clear that maybe some of the best films are those kinds of films, the films that challenge us and the films that, um, have a mysterious quality to them, right? Or they, they kind of take the form of, of an enigma. You know, you continually try to decode why a film affects you or doesn't affect you in a certain way. Um, and it's not like you're you're forcing yourself to 
to come to the point where you like it, right? I mean, that's not what I'm really looking to do with this film. Um, but I can see it's, it's a film that I will continue to revisit and maybe one day it will connect with me more, you know, as, as my experiences in my own life, um, inform new interpretations of what I'm seeing on screen here or, or just make things more impactful in a way that I may not expect. And I think that's what great cinema can do is our appreciation can evolve with the passage of time. You know, when we, when we do or inc- incorporate our own experiences or um, just the ability to come at it from a different perspective. Um, yeah, so it's it's a film that, I think really fits into that mold perfectly. Well, I think that, you know, like you say, you're not even trying to maybe come to a different opinion of the film, but you are trying to wrestle with it and grow with it, I suppose, and let it speak to you in different ways. And I I think that's why there's certain movies that I keep coming back to as well, movies that you love, but also movies that you don't like, but they some reason just kind of stir something within you that you go, I got to figure out what's going on there. And this is definitely that kind of movie, whether you like it or not. I think anybody who watches this would be hard-pressed not to be touched by something in it, right? There's something yeah. in this film that's going to resonate with your experience, that's going to resonate with just the visuals. I mean, I, 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 there's nobody who could look at this and say, oh, that's not a good-looking movie. Yeah. You know, so <laughs> Lubezki's cinematography is... Really, uh, like you said, at times astounding. I mean, some of it's just happenstance, but some of it's just you you have a genius who knows where to put his camera to catch things in this free-flowing way. That really is quite amazing. Yeah. Criterion's release is somewhat of a miracle, right? So we have this extended edition. We have the original. Uh, we have quite a bit of supplemental material. Um, uh documentary from 2011 that is this the only is this the only time in the criterion collections history that the fans successfully got them to change the original cover art do you I, remember the original cover art of this it was different yeah i do remember that I, I i'm not crazy about the cover that they ended up with either but <laughs> actually i prefer the one they rejected over the one that they have i do as well actually um it was, i think it was like a a real close-up shot of Jessica Chastain, if I remember. I'm sure you can still find it out there. It was her, and then the two of the like two, two of the. Boys. You can see it on Google, but yeah. uh, you got her. You got the two boys, RL and Jack, and then you got just a little bit of like the stars, and that's about it. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. it's just uh, there's something very magical about that cover art. This one's just so blah. Yeah, <laughs> if you ask me, to be honest. Yeah, it's it's a little bit plain, but the. The interior packaging is nice as well. I mean, there's a, a booklet with some good um, uh, material and photographs and essays. and I, So the presentation overall is, is very nice, but I, I agree with you on the cover. I mean, I, I think the cover could have been a bit more creative uh, in that regard. But there's some new interviews with Jessica Chastain and the uh, visual effects supervisor, Dan Glass, uh, video essay on cinematography, uh, uh, an interview on the use of classical music in the film. So uh, quite a bit of material here. I mean, for people that are really into this film, there's there's a lot to parse through. I, I think the 2011 documentary is may have been included on the original Fox Blu-ray. Um, I, I don't think that's that was newly created, I, or it wasn't because it's from 2011. So uh, it's really a beautiful release, though, and and. It, stands on the shelf very nicely next to Thin Red Line and Badlands and The New World and all the other Malik Criterion releases. So uh, I'm, I'm glad to own it, even though uh, my mixed feelings about the film continue to this day. It's still something that uh, is, is really neat to see on disc in this form. So it's a, It is a fascinating release, and I also just think it's kind of funny. I didn't think about this until I watched it again, but this was, as you said, released by Fox. So I think that means that this is now technically owned by Disney. So isn't that just funny to think of this as a Disney film at this point? Yeah, well, it's Fox Searchlight, which – does Fox Searchlight even exist anymore? I, I think they maybe um, 
closed down that wing of Fox when Disney acquired it. I think they did, but I think I think Disney acquired everything from it. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, is this on Disney Plus? I probably not yet. <laughs> I think Disney Plus <laughs> is going to have some kind of adult subsection or something with uh with Fox titles. I think that's already premiered. Yeah, there, there's some plan they have yeah. coming or at least overseas they're going to do that. I don't know what their plan is for domestically, but they got something overseas they're doing on that. Yeah, I or it might be going through Hulu uh domestically. I I, I can't remember where where all the the chips fell on that, but uh yeah, it's weird to to think that Disney owns this. Yeah, this is this is now a Disney movie. So <laughs> I, I I kind of want to go to like, you know, some families I know with little kids and go, "Hey, here's a Disney movie." <laughs> Well, the cover just see what uh, looks like, you know, makes it look like it could be like a Disney princess movie or something. Um, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> well, we come to the the final question as usual here, Nate. Does Terrence Malick's The Tree of Life belong in the Criterion Collection? I'm going to say yes because I think. It marks Malik is an important director, and it marks an important movement in his career. I do think there's other work of his that's better. I think his his subsequent film to this, To the Wonder, is much better, and I would actually love to see that get into the collection. But I would say yes, this belongs there because I do think it's important, and it obviously resonated with people in an important way. I think as well. Um, so I would say yes. Well, I'm going to throw another curveball at you. And- say yes as well i i do think it deserves to be in the in the collection i was not expecting that (laughs) (laughs) even though i i have my reservations about it and continue to struggle with the film uh there's a lot to admire here there's a lot that i do find moving in the film and i agree with you It, it marks an important turning point in malik's career i do think you know the the creation of this extended uh, cut through Criterion is a pretty special thing. But e- even just speaking to the, the original theatrical cut, uh, it definitely falls in that important camp uh, when it comes to uh, just the, the history of cinema. And I, I agree with you on, on To the Wonder. I, if people have not seen that film or you know haven't revisited it in a while, definitely take a look at that. I I'm a big fan of that film. I think it's far more effective than this film. Uh, stylistically, very, very similar. And it's it's one that I agree has been really overlooked. But yeah, Song to Song, Night of Cups, n- did not work for me on the same level. But there's something about To the Wonder that uh, that really deserves more attention. So I'm glad you brought that up. Well, thanks for listening this evening to our laborious conversation and hopefully we did not lose (laughs) our entire cinephile audience in the process next month we'll be discussing ingmar bergman's the silence which will be released sometime in march thanks again and have a good evening Okay, so Matt's brain has fried, people. Uh, I think I think the tree of life absolutely fried every neuron in his brain.